John? Oh, John. Be sure to check your email. Okay. All right, everybody. Settle down. Settle down. At ease. At ease. Hey, Mike. There we go. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you tonight. We have our evening, Wednesday evening Bible study. And uh, hello to those in the parking lot, those who may be watching online. We're glad to see you. And uh, we're going to be studying Acts chapter 18 tonight. Hope that you'll uh, uh, get your Bibles ready for that. We always like to, to start, well, let's start with a few announcements first before we get into our prayer requests. Uh, for announcements, uh, Vera, wave everybody, Vera is going to be available for Sunday School Literature afterwards out here. And uh, where are you going to be, Vera? Fellowship Hall. Uh, if you have not picked up your Sunday School Literature, so see Vera after this service. Also, I'm going to meet with the uh, those interested in being greeters. I want to talk to people about greeting. Uh, greeting is an important ministry in church. So if you'd like to be a greeter to, uh, here or out here, um, we'd love, we need a lot of people greeting in the parking lot, making sure, you know, the scariest time for a visitor in going to a church is about the time they park the car and walk from the car to the church. They don't know what to do. They don't know what they're going to encounter. They need to find somebody with a smile and uh, somebody to greet properly. We're going to give a little training for that. I'm going to meet everybody in the uh, foyer out there after the service who'd like to be. If you'd like, just come and listen. Just come. That'd be fine. And uh, I'll share with you some uh, things I want you to do. Yeah. All greeters. If you're going to greet any time, you need to be there. I know you have Sunday school greeters here. I'm talking about outside greeters, greeters at the front door for the worship services and greeters for Sunday school as well. Yeah, all of them, everybody, all y'all. Mountains, we say all y'all. <laughs> ushers, ushers, absolutely. Uh, don't forget the men's breakfast Saturday, 7.30. Uh, don't forget the time change Saturday night. Uh, also, uh, we are going to have a nursery, 8.30 and 11 services this week. Services are 8.30 and 11 this week. We're moving it back an hour, so don't forget that time change. All right. Let me go back down here to my prayer list. I got uh, several on the prayer list. Many of you heard that uh, Jody Smith came home from the hospital. So praise the Lord, she's, she's better, but uh, well enough to come home. Uh, I heard from uh, Glenda Frazee's family today that her surgery went very well. And uh, now they're just going to wait and see how her recovery is. So let's remember the phrases. Helen Averett had a fall, and she's home again. Uh, Bill Smith, Pat's husband, surgery went well, and he's recovering. So let's pray for Bill Smith. Nick Angeloni is facing there. The 20th. The 20th. I want to write that down. Yeah, that's, I thought that was a Saturday. Nick on the 20th. Okay. All right. And uh, I see Maurice Taylor here. I'm glad to see Maurice praying for you. Stacy Whittington is going to have some surgery, I understand. So let's remember him. George uh, Whittington had that fall, you know. We're praying for George. Shirley Souter is taking care of cancer treatments. Uh, remember her. Uh, let's remember, um, let's see, Shirley Bayrath. Shirley and Rick. All right. Good. She's doing better. Good. Good. Glad to see Clarence and Janie here. Praying for you guys. We sure are. David's here. And Ann. Glad David and Ann are here.
Praise the Lord. That's good. Praise the Lord. That's good news. Good. Thank you, Vera. Others to add. Yes. Yes. Two weeks. We got that. Absolutely. I hope he doesn't have to cook. Does he have to cook with you? <laughs> Good. Glenn? School teachers. Okay. Let's pray for our. I, I agree. We're putting Misty down and the teachers. Okay. Yes. I hope you will pray for the members of Ladner, L-A-D-N-E-R, family. We have a death in the family. Oh, Ladner family had a death in their family. What's your name? Kleppinger. Okay. Plessinger. Plessinger. Gotcha. Gotcha. Any others? Any unspoken requests? Would you signify by the uplifted hand? We have lost people to pray for. Hope you'll pray for our Sunday school. Pray for Sunday school. Invite somebody to Sunday school. Let's do that because we want to make sure that everybody has class. We are going to have two tents set up here on each side of the sidewalk in the, uh, North Portico, and people, greeters will be there to help you. Anybody that doesn't know what class you're in, if you're new in church, we'll get you to the appropriate class. We'll make sure you get there. And then we're going to have biscuits for you. We had a picture of those beautiful biscuits Sunday morning at church. I'm going to have biscuits for you Sunday morning. All right. Amen. Let's pray together as we start. Father, I thank you for your great and precious promises. I thank you that seed time and harvest, day and night, summer and winter, never fail. And your mercy is, is as constant as those. It never fails. You make your son to rise on the good and the bad, the saved and the lost. You send your showers of refreshing upon the land and all enjoy it. And Father, you have showered us with blessings which are special in Jesus Christ. We've been blessed to know Jesus. We want others to know the blessing of knowing him. And so, Lord, when we have Sunday school to, to learn the word and grow in the word, it's to bless people, to get them closer to Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you'd continue to make this a blessing place where Jesus lives and moves and, and does great work with a mighty hand of grace. I pray that you'd continue to extend your grace through this church to this community, and that you'd extend your grace to those that we've called in, uh, for prayer tonight. And pray that your grace would continue to sustain and keep them, especially those in grief. And we pray, Father, that this Sunday we're going to see the hand of God move in lives and transform and lead people to Jesus. Bless now this time of studying your word. Make it real in our hearts and alive in our spirit as we ask you to come and meet with us and teach us through your Holy Spirit, the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Tonight's message is a little bit different. I used to have the collected works of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Man, he wrote hundreds and hundreds of sermons. And I noticed that he did something that probably I'm going to try to do a little bit tonight, something Gary does on Monday night with the men. On Sunday evening services, I think uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon did not have a sermon ready. And so what he'd do is he'd pick out a scripture, and he'd just talk about a scripture verse by verse. And uh, some of that stuff was really good. But uh, he didn't have a formal sermon. I do have a, a theme around tonight's, and that is I want to talk about how grace works in our lives. 
Because sometimes we don't realize that, that uh, grace is working in this church. God, the moving of God's hand is always a moving of grace. Now think about uh, D.L. Moody once wanted to study grace. He had never studied grace much. And he sat down and spent a whole day studying grace. He got so engrossed that he took another day and kept on studying. He got so engrossed that he took another day. Three days he just sat there and all he studied was the grace of God. He was so full of excitement about the grace of God, he, he walked out on the street and the first man he, he saw, he grabbed him and said, Do you know grace? And the guy looked at him and said, Grace who? <laughs> he said, Why, the grace of God that brings salvation to all men. And you know, he was so full of grace that he didn't realize what he was saying. Now realize something. We can get full of, we, listen, I'll show you a scripture on this. It's in John. Let me see if I can find this scripture for you. John 1, excuse me. No, it's Acts 6, 8. Stephen was a man full of God's grace and power. Acts 6, 8. Stephen was a man full of God's grace and power. You know what? I read that this week and I thought, we're always praying for his power. But do we ever pray for his grace? I want to be a powerful man in the Lord, but do I want to be a gracious man in the Lord? The Bible said grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, John 1, 17. Now, by the way, let me remind you, grace, Jesus brought grace and truth. Grace and truth. If you've just got grace without truth, you got a liberal church. Oh, wanting to give God's love to everybody, but not wanting to give God's truth to everybody. When you've got grace without truth, you got liberalism. But when you've got truth without grace, you got legalism. The Bible says, and I'm glad it says, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What have you got when you got grace and truth? You got Cedar Falls Baptist Church. Amen? You can get grace and and truth at Cedar Falls Baptist Church. John 1 16, from the fullness of his grace, we have received one blessing after another. Every move of God is a, is a gracious move on our, on our behalf. Now, by the way, you know what grace is. If you say grace is unmerited favor, let me tell you this. I found this this week. I thought it was good. Grace is when God gives us things we don't deserve. Mercy is when he spares us from the things we do deserve. And blessings when he gives us both. Say that again. Grace is when God gives us things we don't deserve. Mercy is when he spares us from the bad things we do deserve. And blessings is when he gives us both grace and truth. Here's an illustration I read this week of a, a man who said that uh, back during the Depression, I don't know if you're familiar with the Depression days in the 1920s, 30s, the railroads had people riding the cars looking for jobs from city to city. and The railroads had hobo shacks and ho hobo villages and towns. I'm sure Fayetteville had some. He said there was a hobo village near his house, and his mother would feed those. If they knocked on the door, she'd feed them. Because she knew people were starving. And he said there was one hobo that she fed. And later he stole from their house. They weren't looking. He stole something. They knew it. He said six months later, that hobo came back starving. And he said, I watched my mom feed that same man again. He didn't think we knew him, but we did. My mom knew that was the guy that had robbed from her earlier. But he said, I watched my mom feed that guy one more time. And he said this, he was not only des not deserving of the food, he was deserving of punishment. But my mom gave him both. He wasn't deserving the food, he was deserving of punishment. But my mom fed him anyway. That's grace. That's mercy. And really, that's what, what we are too. 
Every move of God on our behalf is, is a grace move. And I want us to, by the way, if you're taking notes, there are three aspects to grace, just so you'll know. There's saving grace, there's sanctifying grace, and there's glorifying grace. Grace shows up in salvation. You, you're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are we saved through faith. Saving grace. There's sanctifying grace. You know what that is? That's the grace that makes you like Jesus. Adnar Judson, was, uh, his wife was reading something, and somebody she said to her husband, somebody here is writing that, that you're like the Apostle Paul. He said, I don't want to be like the Apostle Paul. I want to be like Jesus. <laughs> sanctifying grace is the grace he gives you, works in your life every day to make you more Christ-like. And then there's glorifying grace, glorification. And that is to bring you to, to heaven. We're going to realize that grace one day. And by the way, we all need that grace, don't we? By the way, I, I've got to tell you this one story. A uh, young girl got a call from her not-so-smart boyfriend. And uh, he said, can you come over and help me put this puzzle together? I'm having a hard time putting a puzzle together. She said, sure. She came over to help me put the puzzle together. He had it spread out on the table there. And she said, what's this puzzle supposed to be? And he said, a rooster. Well, she looked at the piece of the puzzle on the table and said, with grace in her heart, said, honey, said, uh, we're never going to get these pieces to work. I said, she said, why don't we just put all these cornflakes back in the box? <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Bobby finally got it right down here. <laughs> now listen, sometimes we do stupid stuff. And thank God for people who have grace. Amen. Let's look at a scripture today. I want to read the scripture, three different scriptures, and just take a moment to, to, to look at these scriptures. First is Acts chapter 18, verse 12 through 17. I want you to notice. Now I got three points on this one. Notice that Paul is probably going to be shocked by a grace work of God. I want us to look at this. Look at verse uh, 12. Well, verse 11. And he continued, he's uh, in Corinth, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God to them. And when Gallio, Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Please underline that sentence. He's saying that you should do things contrary to the law. I'll tell you something, folks. In Washington, they're making laws against us. That line is going to be used against us. The churches are doing things, things contrary to the law. Here's another cross-reference scripture. Psalm 9420. Psalm 9420 talks about evil people making laws for the land. And when evil people start making laws, and I think we've got evil people making laws in America, God knows when evil people make laws. So he said, he's telling people to do things contrary to the law. Well, I'll tell you what, we may have to do that. Because I think laws are being made, I think, against the Constitution, even on the United States of America. Next, and when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O oh, Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I don't want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. And then all the Greeks took Sophanes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. This reminds me of Esther, doesn't it? You know, the, remember the guy made the the, the, the scaffold for Mordecai, and he had to hunt, he hung it on himself. He, he got hanged on himself. But Gallio took no notice of these things, so Paul remained a good while, and we'll stop right there. In other words, they're trying to get Paul in trouble, but God's working. The hand of God was moving on Gallio and turned and reversed this whole situation and kept Paul safe. Now, when I read that, I thought about, the, I thought about how, 
how God's grace was working on Paul's behalf. And I wrote three things down in, in, in reference to this scripture. Number one, when you are where God wants you, he will protect you and give you the grace to stay there. When you're where God wants you, he'll give you grace there. Paul had told, uh, God had told Paul to stay in Corinth, didn't he? We read that earlier. Stay there. I've got many people in this place. Keep preaching the gospel. So he was where God wanted him. And when you're where God wants you, the grace of God will keep you there and protect you there. He will protect you with his grace. Daniel was where God wanted him. And Daniel in the lion's den was protected by God's grace. We can look also at uh, Gideon was in God's will. He was protected by God's grace. God will never send you somewhere that his grace will not keep you. Wherever God sends you, his grace will keep you. And so there he is facing trouble. Look at Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery. He went through terrible thing, times, but he remained gracious, and God's grace kept walked him through that until he became prime minister of Egypt. Folks, I tell you this. You cannot have the grace of God working for you if you're not where God wants you. So you better say all the time, am I where God wants me? If I am, then I don't need to be afraid. God will take care of me. I don't believe Daniel was afraid. God would take care of him because he's where God wanted him. So the first thing we say, say is that God's grace is, if you want his grace to flow through you and his hands to be with you, be where, he, where you're supposed to be. Number two, stay gracious. He told Paul to stay gracious, stay filled with God's grace. Corinth was a tough place. And I want to show you, tell you how this works. I, I, I ran across this old story. Some of you may have heard this, and many of you may not have heard it. There was a young man out of college working in a grocery store. I think it was in St. Louis. The young man's name was Kurt, working in a grocery store. He just happened to look up and saw that the cashier was pretty. Caught his eye. He thought, wow. So when he checked out of work that afternoon, he noticed she came in and checked out, and he, 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 he got her name off the card. And uh, saw her walking home. And uh, said, can I give you a ride? And uh, she said, sure. So he gave her a ride home, and he asked her for a date. And she said, no, I can't date. I, I, I have two children. I, I, can't, I can't afford a babysitter. He said, I'll pay for a babysitter. She said, all right. So he hired a babysitter, showed up for the date. She said, can't go on the date. Babysitter didn't show up. He said, we'll take, I'll take the kids out. She said, you don't understand. My son has Down syndrome. He's in a wheelchair. He said, doesn't matter. I'll take him. We'll put his wheelchair in the car. Got the child, put him in the car, took him, won her heart. In other words, here's a good man. Ain't, do y'all know what I'm talking about? There's a good man. Kurt, such a good man, she married Kurt. And some of you know the rest of the story. While he was uh, uh, a little bit later, that stock clerk got a phone call from the, uh, the Rams National Football League, needed a quarterback. And he became quarterback uh, of the Rams and also later the, the Cardinals. He won the Super Bowl, became most valuable player in the NFL. And uh, he was a Christian man. And I want to tell you something. The thing that stood out for me is this. He kept a good heart. When, when you've got a good heart like that, God wants the world to see your heart. He gives grace to you so that you could show the world your heart. I want to talk to my, our greeters here in just a few moments. And I want to say to our greeters, you're, if you're going to be a greeter, I want you to hear this. The first person that will encounter the love of God in this church is a greeter. Uh, 
to a lot to a person walking in. Somebody walk, the first encounter with God's love is to the greeters. And your heart is so important that you have a love for Jesus and a love for people. And I realize that that grace is the most important quality we can have to touch our hearts. Stay gracious and God things happen. Paul stayed gracious and God protected him. Here's one more thing I noticed in this. God uses situations for revelations. Sometimes the situations that scare us most are God's revelations. God's got a revelation in those situations that, that unnerve us. Listen, as Satan moves against you, grace will move for you. Say that again. If you are in God's will, grace is in your heart. When Satan moves against you, grace will move for you. He said, I'll give you grace for that moment, for that hour. I, I've got to tell, I, I love telling stories, but I miss Ravi Zacharias. Anybody miss Ravi? Boy, he was, whoa, what a man. In 1971, toward the end of the Vietnam War, he did a crusade in Vietnam, had a translator, and uh, I'll not mention his name, I forgot it right there, Ben, Hein Ben or something. And uh, when Vietnam fell, his translator could not get out. Christian guy translating for him, trying to win people to Jesus, 1971. Fell in 75, couldn't get out. The communists collected all the Christians, and he was one. Put them in re-education camps. He said they had a constant indoctrination of Marx and Engels and communism. Just bombarded them, wouldn't let them go, just bombarded them. He said, I began to doubt. Now, he, he called Ravi some years later and told him this story. He said, I began to doubt God, whether it was real. He said, in this concentration camp, they were using Bibles for toilet paper. That's the indoctrination they had. And he said, I was assigned one, on one occasion to clean the latrine. When I got in there, I found a, a scrap of paper that was soiled. And he said, I, I saved it. Took it back to my room and that night cleaned it up. And he said, when I cleaned it up, I read it was Romans chapter 8. What can separate me from the love of God? Neither height nor depth nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come. And also in that was that all things work together for good, those who love the Lord. He said, God had, had that slip of paper laying out there for me to find. And he said, what that did to my heart, it, it solidified my, my faith again. When you're in a crisis, God will send you a word, he'll send you a, a person, or he'll send you an opportunity of grace. But we have got to look for that grace. He sent Paul a word of grace but if your heart isn't receptive to that grace, you're going to miss God's doing it. And so Paul here has a wonderful experience uh, of grace. Now let's go on and look at the next one. The next one is very important. I, I, I hope that I can do this next one properly. Verse 18 says, So Paul still remained a good while, and then he took leave of his brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila, were with him. He had it. Now look, watch this. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And they asked him to stay a little time longer with them. He did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing, and he sailed for Ephesus. Well, let's stop right there. I want to talk for a moment about vows. You know, some people have criticized Paul right here on this scripture. Why did he take a vow? Why did he have to get to Jerusalem for a Jewish holiday? I thought Paul had opposed legalism, and here he is taking a vow, cutting his hair. How does that jive 
with what Paul wrote about legalism. Well, let me just say this. Apparently, he didn't see it as a contradiction. He was still a Jew. Paul says, I become all things to all men that I might by all being safe son. That's why he was going to Jerusalem. But I want you to notice something. Paul made a vow. Are vows wrong for Christians? Well, Jesus said, we're not to swear by this and swear by the temple or swear by, wait a minute. He's talking about something different than what Paul's talking about. When Jesus said you're not to swear by the temple and, and other things, he wasn't talking about vows. He was talking about your reputation. In other words, I promise you, I'm, not, I'm, I'm telling the truth, I'll swear by the temple. That's to people. Vows are vows to God. And so he made a vow to God. Why did he shave his head? Do you remember the Nazarites in the Old Testament? Never shaved their head? When they shaved their head, if they did shave their head later in life, it was a commitment to God. It was a humbling act. Now let me tell you what a vow is. I wrote my own definition of it. A vow is when you obligate yourself to God. A vow is pledging to hold yourself accountable to Almighty God for a high purpose. I'm obligating myself. God, I vow. Who made vows in the Bible? Hannah, God, give me a child, and I'll give him back to you. Zacchaeus in the New Testament, Lord, I promise to give away half I own. If I've cheated anybody, I'll pay him back fourfold, however what many it was. And Jesus blessed him for that vow, didn't he? He vowed to, to correct. It's a pledge of, of honor. Vow gives us, vows give us direction and purpose in life. When you make a vow, suddenly that vow becomes your purpose before Almighty God. And I realize that it's important that we need to make some vows, sacred vows to God. God, if you will bless my family. What did Joseph say? There was Joseph on the run from his, uh, Joseph, Jacob on the run from his brother. Esau was after him. Jacob's on the run. That first night, he puts a rock down for a pillow, has a vision of God and the angels ascending and descending the ladder. You remember that. But what did he say when he woke up? God's in this place and I didn't know it. And he said this, God, if you will be with me and keep me and bring me back safely to my family through all this, you will be my God. And I will serve you. That was a vow. And what did God do? <laughs> he obligated himself to God. God, if you'll be with me, I'm obligated to be with you no matter what. And God fulfilled his part. And Jacob fulfilled his. So I think sometimes vows are important. Now, I wrote down what I have some, some rules for vows. Sometimes you might want to, you might be in a situation of desperation. And you say, God, I need you. And you just, I want to show you my dedication because God's grace flows. He will meet you in a vow. That's what I'm saying. Grace will flow to a vow. Here's some rules for vows. Number one, make sure it's a vow that God will agree with. <laughs> will God agree to the vow? I mean, anybody know a vow in the Bible that God wouldn't agree with? I got one. We're going to read it a little bit later. Remember when Paul was arrested? You know, you've read the Bible. Later on, we'll, we'll see. He's going to be arrested. And 40 people from the synagogue, the temple, agree not to eat until they kill Paul. They made a vow. Now, I've often wondered. I wonder if those guys starved to death. I wonder if they lived up to that vow. That's an unholy vow. God, I... I'm going to kill them. I'm going to hurt them. Well, that's not a God-blessed vow. Because God worked just opposite of that vow, didn't he? No weapon formed against you shall prosper, the Bible says. So they made a vow to kill Paul. And his nephew heard it and went and told the, uh, the centurion. And Paul got out of there. So make sure it's one God agrees with. Number two, make sure it's one that you, you carry out. When you make a vow, 
You better carry it out. Write down Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of land and they told the Lord, we're giving all this to the Lord, but they didn't. And what happened to them? They carried them both out dead, didn't they? Now, by the way, we make vows in church all the time. How many are married? Did you make a vow when you got married? Uh-huh. You ever had a pledge campaign? You make a vow then? Uh-huh. Have you ever been in the military? I pledge to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. I wish they would read that in Washington and mean it. They stand, raise their hands and say, I'll support and defend the Constitution against all enemies and turn right around and disobey the laws and don't enforce the laws of the Constitution. It's amazing to me. There are laws out there, folks, that have been made. They wouldn't honor them themselves. By the way, i got to tell you a story. A pastor, old story of a pastor who said that he had a very wealthy guy in church, got sick and was dying. And the guy was on his deathbed. The pastor went to see him, pray with him, and he said, Pastor, if the Lord would raise me up, I'll give the church a million dollars. Sounds like a vow, doesn't it? Well, guess what? The guy got well. The pastor said, I didn't see him in church. Ran into him on the street one day and said, hey, wait a minute. You said when you were sick that if you got well, you'd give the church a million dollars. Said the guy looked at him and said, well, pastor, that just tells you how sick I was. Strange people in this world, aren't they? When you make a vow, God's going to hold you to that vow, or it will cost you more than you ever imagined. Here's a, here, here, here. By the way, let me give you two scriptures. Numbers 30, verse 2. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that comes out of his mouth. Deuteronomy 23, 12. Deuteronomy 23, 12. When thou, when thou shalt vow, not if, when. When thou, thou shalt vow a vow to the Lord thy God, thou shalt not be slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it will be a sin to thee. It becomes a sin if you don't pay it. Here's the third rule. Make sure your vow is for his purposes and not yours. Make sure your vow is for him, his purposes, to be accomplished, not your purposes. You know, uh, Lord, I want my child to, to, to get into college. I vow, <laughs> no, wait a minute, you're twisting God's arm. Sometimes people, it's like they're trying to twist God's arm. Now, Lord, I'm going to do this, and I'm expecting you to do this. Well, don't tell God what to do. You're not making this vow for, for you, you're making it for him and for his kingdom. Vows should create holiness and lead to holiness. And so he shaves his head, makes a vow. I, I, I looked up some vows we might have. Let me just mention a couple. I offer myself as a willing vessel to be used by you and to be filled by you. God, I am yours. All that I am and that I have is yours. I step out of my comfort zone. I no longer hold on to my life as I know it. I'm no longer looking forward to life as usual. I'm yours. I give my life to you. Lord, I hold nothing back from you. But I, I promise I withhold nothing. I will release all embarrassments, all fear, all pride, all selfishness, anything you require. I release my life to you and my time I surrender, promising to give it to your kingdom. And God blesses those commitments, folks. Let me go one more. Verse 24 through 28, those are vows. That's God's grace flows to commitments. And here's one last one. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught according to the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. 
Now, in other words, he didn't know about Jesus, but he was baptizing from John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside, filling in the gaps of his knowledge, and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. Believed through what? Through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Listen. We have to be able to say, as Priscilla and Aquila did, and as Apollos did after he found Jesus, make me an instrument of grace. That's what Apollos came. Now, Apollos was a fervent man, an eloquent man, but he was a teachable man. Came aside, can we tell you something? Yeah, you can tell me. He was teachable. And they showed him that uh, what he had missed, he had missed the atonement, the death on the cross, and they told him about Jesus. Make, help me to be an instrument of your grace. And I'm going to close on that. Can I be an instrument of your grace? I told the staff today at a staff meeting a story that I'd run across, and I'm going to close on this, of a, an American businessman who was trying to set up a business in China. They were going to produce his product in China, as many are. He said, in China, it's required that you have somebody assigned to you uh, from the government to work with you. And he had a, a government person assigned to him, and this American was a Christian. He prayed, read the Bible, and they spent so much time together that the, 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 the government guy was an atheist, didn't believe in God, but he watched him. Grace was, was you could see the grace in his heart. The Americans said that uh, it was fall of the year, and he would go to a Mandarin church there in China, said, I did not understand a word of what they were saying, <laughs> but I was in church. And when they walked forward, by the way, they walked forward to give their offering if you've been in any of the African-American churches here in Fayetteville, as I've visited some, you must walk forward. Everybody, while the pastor stands in the pulpit and looks at you giving an offering. Did y'all know that? That's the offering style in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Row by row, you come and the pastor watches. Well, he walked forward and gave his offering. They have so many people in China come to church at Christmas, they have to give out tickets to let people in. You can't come to church without a ticket on Christmas Day. So they gave him two tickets. He gave his two tickets to the guy he had been working with from the Communist Party, the atheist. He came home to America. He knew he wasn't going to be there at Christmas. He, came, he was at home in America, and he got an email from the guy in China saying that he had, he had taken his wife to that Christmas service, and they had both given their life to Christ. Isn't that a good story? He said, not only so, but after that, we hired him to work for us. Uh, I hired him. He became one of my main workers there in China. And, you know, I thought, there is nothing more joyful than being an instrument of grace. I, I, I wish more Christians took as much joy in being gracious as they did in griping. You know? If we could be more gracious, imagine what grace would flow. And uh, to our ushers, we've got to be gracious. And to, to, to the church, you are, but we have to be gracious always. I can't tell you the people over the years who have spoken to me and said, Pastor, after joining my church, they would say something like this, Pastor, we went to XYZ church and nobody spoke to us. We came in, we came out, nobody said a word. And I'll tell you something, God's not going to work in that kind of church. He wants his grace, he, he talked there about being full of grace. Stephen was a man full of grace and power, so let's ask God to fill us with grace. Let Make that a prayer request. Fill us with grace and see what happens. I believe if you're full of grace, you'll have full power too. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ.
All right, let's pray together. and Let's pray over those needs that we just mentioned earlier. If you'd like to join me at the altar, let's pray and spend a few moments bringing these to the Lord. Join me in prayer. Father, as we pray today, I know the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those that are crushed in spirit. And Lord, the enemy is working to crush spirits, but I know that your spirit is working to bless. Some are being crushed with ordeals like Glenda Frazee and her long ordeal with cancer. God bless her. Don't let her be crushed by it. Some are trying to be crushed like Shirley Souter, Shirley Bayrath. And I pray for them, Lord, that you would sustain them and heal them and, uh, and that you would get poor grace into them to keep them from being crushed, but you would touch them physically with restoration. You give rest to the weary. You allow your streams of healing and strength to flood the, the, the lives of, of those who are parched. I pray, Father, for your healing grace to touch, continue to bless the eeks as they recover from COVID. Bless Stacy Whittington as he faces surgery. Bless Nick Angeloni. Guide the doctor's surgery upon him as you did with Bill Smith and, Shirley, and, and Glenda Frazee today. We thank you. We pray that you'd continue to bless Misty as she faces surgery and that you'll prepare her and prepare the doctor that it will be a success. We, ask, we commend her to your grace. We ask for the Ladner family and the Filzer family to be ministered to in their time of grief as they are downcast and crushed with loss. Put your comforting arms around them. Let your abundant power touch them with overwhelming grace. Be the solution for everybody's problem that we've mentioned this night and release into them that grace they need and let them know that they've been touched by you. And Father, this Sunday morning, 
is a special Sunday for us. We get back to Sunday school face to face, fellowshipping again. And the enemy has kept us from it for, for one solid year. But we're ready, Lord, to get back and study your word. Make your word alive in every class. Put your hand upon every teacher. Let the glory of the Lord be on this church. Hedge it about with your angels. Let nothing evil enter. Pour out your Holy Spirit. And I pray that in worship and Sunday school, we're going to feel the thrill of the fellowship of your Holy Spirit in this place. Be glorified as we commend this need for Sunday school to you and ask you to bless Vera and everyone planning and working and uh, that we're going to see the great hand of God upon our Sunday school, upon our church, and that we'll see souls saved, Jesus lifted high. For it's in his name we pray for all these. Amen. Amen. Sunday morning. Sunday morning I'm continuing up Calvary's mountain. And I'm going to deal with uh, Jesus and fear. Jesus' fear level, I think, was off the Richter scale. He sweat drops of blood. And he said, Lord, if it's you're possible, take this cup from me. In his flesh, he did not want to drink that cup. But you know what I think Jesus was afraid of? He wasn't afraid of death. I don't think Jesus was afraid of dying. I think Jesus was afraid of failing his father. He was going to become sin for us. And folks, he didn't know what that was like. He had no idea. And so I think that uh, we need to learn what Jesus did when he faced fears. We face it all the time. The first thing he did, and I will say this, when they bind your hands, bend your knees. He started praying then. When Satan and situations bind your hands, bend your knees. So we'll be talking about that Sunday morning, okay? Going to meet uh, those that want to be greeter, are willing to be greeters. You've not thought about it, but just want to hear. Come back to the foyer. We want to chat with you for just a few moments. Thank you, everybody.